Today I wanted to share with you a segment of the online course that I created, Foundations in Anatomy and Body Science for Yoga Teachers. Now this is a 10 hour online course and it's the first segment that I do in the 30 hour segment that goes into our 200 hour yoga teacher training. And I wanted to take this information and put it online because I feel like a lot of people struggle with the anatomy portion in their yoga training and it can be helpful to go back and watch it over and over and really absorb the terminology and get comfortable with all the information because that's how we start to build on that foundation and create a really solid understanding of our body and how it interacts with this practice of yoga. So I hope you find this segment to be helpful and I'll put a link in the description below if you want to check out the full course. To talk about the planes of the body. So these are imaginary dividing lines that show us the plane on which movement happens. We kind of chunk them into three different categories in terms of what movement happens on that plane. And then it's also a way of thinking about the way that we're looking at the body in terms of certain imaging or dissections when we're studying the parts of the body in anatomy. So there's the view of the three different planes. And I like to use this idea of a, a sheet of glass that's either dividing the body into a left and a right half. So that would be the sagittal plane, that very first one. Sagittal plane goes right through the middle, divides the body into the left and the right sides. The coronal plane, or sometimes you'll hear it called the frontal plane. I always think coronal because it divides the crown of the head or where it would sit. Like if I was wearing a tiara, it would sit right there. So that's my coronal plane, but you will call, you will see it called the frontal plane because it splits the body into front and back or anterior and posterior. So that dividing line right through the body there. The third plane is the transverse plane. And this goes across the body and would divide it into a superior and an inferior piece. Superior and inferior or um, above and below that transverse plane. So we use these planes. First I'm going to show you how we use this to look at the body in different views. Like if we were looking at imaging or a dissection. So here you can see I'll go in order of the first slide. So here's our sagittal view, meaning if you took a sheet of glass and split me right in half, there was an even left and a right half, and then you kind of turned it to look at the side of my brain, that's what the view would look like, a sagittal view, meaning they took a sagittal slice and then looked at it. So then the next one would be coronal, right? So if you split with that very sharp sheet of glass into a front and a back portion, and then you turned and you looked at it, that's the view that you would get of my brain. And then if you took a transverse slice, it would be like if you chopped off the top portion of my head, took it and looked at it. That would be the transverse view. Actually, I think that one's looking down. And then you can kind of see on the brain there, it shows you what a sagittal view, a coronal view, and a transverse, or here they're saying axial. So again, there's a couple terms that are interchangeable. Most of the time with movement, you'll always hear transverse. Now, this is one of my favorite slides because if you've ever gone to the bodies exhibit, which is the real human bodies that have been dissected in particular ways to show certain pieces of the body and they're preserved. So these preserved dissected bodies travel around so that you can go and see them up close and it's such an interesting experience to really get a good look at what's going on inside of our body instead of studying from a textbook like we do most of the time to see actual cadavers. But here I pulled out three different pictures that show how they dissected on these three different planes. 
So starting with the sagittal view over here, this would be, they took several different slices through the sagittal plane and then laid out those pieces next to each other so you could see them. Then the coronal plane. So here they did that slice from the body dividing into front and back and then lined up all those slices so that you could see where things are positioned in relationship to each other. And then this third one is the transverse plane. So you can see there's all these different dividing lines. And here's the important thing to understand about the three planes of the body. When we look at the picture, I'll go back to the first slide, you always see them in the center of the plane. So mid-sagittal is perfect midline, divides an even left and right side of the body. The frontal plane would be exactly in the middle and the transverse plane would be exactly at the middle. But there's an infinite number of planes that are parallel to that. So you can slice the body into an infinite number of sagittal planes or an infinite number of frontal planes or an infinite number of transverse planes in terms of the way that we're looking at things. That also comes in handy when we start thinking about movement. So first we're just going to look at the movements that happen on the sagittal plane and this will help to solidify exactly what's going on here. So there's just a mid-sagittal, meaning it's perfectly dividing the body into an even left and a right. And this is where the movements of flexion and extension happen. Now we haven't gone over terms of movement yet, so don't panic over those. Just kind of absorb them. I like to say some of what we learn in anatomy is sort of uh, learning by osmosis. When you hear these terms over and over, they just start to sink in. So here's our sagittal plane, that big piece of glass that's splitting the body into a left and a right portion. But if we're going to do movements where the body had to slide along that plane of glass, what would those movements look like? So here we have the movement of the hip forward and back, hip flexion and extension. The movement of the knee forward and back, knee flexion and extension. We could also do the shoulder shoulder flexion and extension. And then here they're showing cat and cow, so the forward and back tilt of the pelvis. Now here's the list. This is flexion and extension, anterior and posterior pelvic tilt, and the ankle, which would be up and down, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. But we'll go through, here's a specific list of all the sagittal plane movements. This is what we're going to do when we do our practice video next. So if you like that kinesthetic learning, that will probably help to solidify this a little bit more. But let's jump on to the next one. So the frontal plane or the coronal plane, as I like to call it, if you're wearing that crown and it was dividing you into an even, anterior and posterior portion of the body. The movements that happen on this plane are abduction, moving away from the center line, and adduction, moving toward the center line. So then we'll look at some examples in yoga. Opening the legs out toward the side, like hip abduction happens on the coronal plane. Um, ankle inversion and eversion, that side-to-side -side movement of the ankle happens on this plane. Trunk lateral flexion, the side-to-side -side tilt with the pelvis, and the side-to-side -side tilt, oh, there we go, side-to-side -side tilt that we can do with our wrist all happens on that plane. This really starts to make sense when you do these movements with the back against the wall, which is exactly what we will do in the practice video. So there's the dividing line. If you looked at the side of the body, it divides anterior and posterior. And then here's all the movements that are happening on that plane. Abduction, adduction, trunk and neck lateral flexion, right and left lateral tilt of the pelvis, inversion and eversion of the ankle, and then that uh, radial and ulnar deviation of the wrist.
there's your full list. We will go through each of those movements in order when we do our practice for this segment. Okay, so then the transverse plane, you can see there just the transverse plane dividing a superior and inferior portion of the body. See, I told you those anatomical terms were going to come back over and over and over. <laughs> So if those still aren't really solidified with you, go back and watch that again and make sure that those terms really make sense because they keep coming back to haunt you if they haven't really taken hold yet. So here's our transverse plane movements. We have rotation. These are all the rotation movements. So shoulder rotation, internal and external. Hip rotation, internal and external. Trunk and neck rotation because think of it if there was like this sheet sitting right here and my head would rotate sliding right along it and then same thing with my trunk it would just kind of slide right along side to side or if it was my shoulder internal and external rotation the other kind of interesting one that happens here is we have this this rotation pronation and supination of the forearm that is also transverse plane movement. And we do a lot of rotation in yoga, so that transverse plane is really important. Here's a list, joint by joint, that we'll go over with the practice video. But before we get into that, I just wanted to talk about how we get even more specific when we're talking about joints and movements. And that's by measuring the degrees of motion that happen at that joint or that are available in that particular movement. So you just picture a circle and zero being the bottom there, 45 degrees, 90 degrees, 135, and 180. And this specifically, I like to do this with the shoulder. So if the shoulder, the arm was down by your side, that would be zero. You could come up 45 degrees in front of you, 90 degrees would be straight in front of the shoulder. 135 and then 180 would be all the way straight up to the ceiling if I had 180, which I don't. How do we measure that? So we have these fancy little gadgets called goniometers and they just have all the numbers written around the circle. So we move one arm and keep the other arm static so that it shows us the degrees and you can kind of have a flashback to geometry class when you're a kid of like using a protractor to measure angles. This is the version of the protractor that we use with the body called a goniometer. So what we'll talk about with certain movements is how maybe the shoulder is at 90 degrees of flexion. So 90 degrees of movement on the sagittal plane or I have 45 degrees of neck rotation, so 45 degrees of movement at the neck on the transverse plane, that rotation plane. That's how we start to get a little bit more specific and that will make even more sense when we go through the terms of movement. But keep in mind, when we first start looking at the planes of movement, we're talking about a single plane, so um, flexion and extension on the sagittal plane, but so often, especially in yoga, we're doing these complex movements. So the movement that's happening at a joint is not just on one plane, it's moving on three different planes. It's very three-dimensional. And that's when the movement analysis gets more complicated. It is more challenging for us to figure out, well, how did the joint get there? What plane of movement was that on? And that's where we have these multi plane movements. And when we do the practice video, I'll show you what that would look like. So especially like the ball and socket joints, the shoulder joint and the hip joint, we can move at the same time on the sagittal, coronal and transverse plane. And we find that a lot in certain yoga poses. So I'll talk about specifically which ones fall into that group. Okay, so now we're going to do our practice to solidify the understanding of the planes of movement in the body, and then we're going to jump into terms of movement and joint position. Okay. 